in. I want this morning just to turn our attention to Hebrews 12. Um, Hebrews chapter 12. So a couple of weeks ago, I don't even particularly know why, but I found myself praying for Emmanuel and praying in particular just for that subject of endurance. Um, will we endure? Will we keep running hard? Um, and came to this passage. Of course, you're probably likely familiar with, at least with um, verse 1 um, where it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And I was just aware of just even the, the pace that some of us run with, um, whether it's Bethlehem Star or you know, uh, you know, the youth and the kids outreaches, or whether it's the summer ministry soccer camps and day camps, or just even you know, serving on worship teams or other ministries. Some of us are really engaged, really involved. You see dad maybe serving in a couple of different ways, and mom serving in a couple of different ways, and kids serving in different ways too, youth sponsors, that kind of thing. And so, with that kind of pace, will we continue to run well? Will we continue to run with endurance? And I don't know about you, but I've found those seasons in my life where if I was being honest, I'd have to say that I haven't ran well. I've found just things have happened that have caused me to slow down. Things have happened that have caused me uh, just maybe to not run as well or properly as I could have or should have. Now, there are those seasons where you maybe are involved with ministries in one area and, and things change. I'm not saying that that's wrong or that that's inappropriate. Um, there's often those times when we transition from one ministry to another ministry or even in, in life. Sometimes we just have to pull back on sort of the organized ministries um, just to minister through life. And so that's not what I'm referring to this morning. But just just that awareness in my own life of those times when, to be quite honest, I have slowed down for no exterior reasons, but rather, um, excuse me, just what's been going on in my own heart. Well, let me uh, read the passage before we uh, delve into this anymore. So it's uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and reading from verse 1 through to 17. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may, be, may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed." Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent. Though he sought it with tears. Just reading so far and trusting that the Lord would bless. 
I'm sure you guys are familiar with Hebrews in the sense that we don't know a lot about it. We're not sure exactly who the author is. Um, he's not named. It's not in the writing style of Paul. Um, so we know it's likely not him. Um, somebody probably who had a, a Jewish background um, just by how he writes. And then he's writing to the Hebrews. And again, we don't know a ton about them. But just a few things that we can um, say from the book that we pick up. And it seems that after they were first converted, they faced significant persecution and trials. It says in Hebrews 10 and verse 32, But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those who treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that yourself had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence which has great reward. And so they had started out well. It seemed that they lost some of their property and yet they were okay with that because they were doing the math and they could work out what they had in Christ and realize the eternal value and that it lasted, that it wouldn't perish. And so it seemed that they got the sort of the mathematical equation and even though I'm sure it wasn't nice to have be pillaged and you know have your stuff taken away from you, it would have been awful. Yet they accepted it, recognizing why they were facing those trials. They knew what it was to suffer for the Lord. They had counted the cost and had paid that price of obedience. Um, And yet it seems that although they had started out well, and although they were faithful in the past, yet now they were starting to slide. There was just things going on within this group, within this church, that were not good, not right. Um, And so you see some of these themes that come up throughout the letter. It seems that they were becoming lazy. We get that in Hebrews 6 and 12. It seems that they were starting to grow weary and lose heart, Hebrews 12 and 3. It seems that their initial enthusiasm was beginning to cool or to wane, Hebrews 3, 14 and, and, and chapter 10 as well. It seems that they had not matured in their faith. He could write them, by now you should be at this level, but you're not. You're still like babes. You're not growing. They were not maturing in their faith. Some had even stopped coming together to meet as the corporate church. They were staying away. Um, And then there were some who were opposing their Christian leaders, whether it was elders or pastors or whatever they referred to them as. But it would seem that they would felt quite free to speak against these leaders and quite free to bring them down a peg or two. Um, And then some were about to give up faith completely, I would read. And so they were, the church that had started out so well was in danger. There were some symptoms and signs of poor health. And even it would seem that temptation to go back. And when you read through Hebrews, I guess one you see that a lot of the pictures are kind of Old Testament images and pictures. And so we can deduce from that that likely as they were the Hebrews and that these were Jewish believers. Church history would say that this was like the second generation. It was likely their parents who had accepted Christ for the first time. And yet with the trouble they had faced over time, it seems that these Christians were starting to slow down and how they ran and even got to the point where they were looking back to um, some of the Jewish traditions and feasts and even looking back to the law and had started to sort of elevate it to a place above Christ. And so the writer to the Hebrews writes this letter saying, hey, look at Christ. He is superior. He is supreme. He is above all. He is above the law. He is above the prophets. He is above angels. Look to him. Not only look to him in the sense of trusting in him, but follow him in that sense that in the same way that he suffered, in the same way that he went through trials, therefore we will follow in those trials and in those trouble, in that trouble as well. And so the writer says to them things like, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And he's laying out for them that if you turn from Christ, if you turn from the gospel, if you turn and try to put confidence in anything else, there's really nothing that will save. There's nothing else that is on that level of the gospel and on the level of Christ. And so he encourages them, he warns them and encourages them about the need for endurance, about the need to embrace suffering and shame. There's that one passage where they say, you know, that we are to go outside the camp like Christ or to go to that place of scorn and suffering. 
One commentator writes repeatedly, he calls his hearers to persevere in the faith and caution them about the dangers of leaving the Christian communion or community as he sought to show the superiority of Christ to mosaic sacrifices and rituals. So how does this relate to Emmanuel this morning? It's really that need to endure That need to endure. And just aware, as I say, in my own life, but even aware in church life of those seasons where it's just possible to be led astray. It's just possible to just to slow down in how we live out our faith and how we serve in the body and just to be on our guard and to be encouraged as to how we can keep running well. And so that's where I want to take us this morning. Just before we look directly at the passage, think of those symptoms that I mentioned earlier. They were becoming lazy somewhere. They were growing weary and losing heart. Their initial enthusiasm began to cool. They had not matured in their faith. Some had stopped meeting together. Some were opposing their Christian leaders. Some were about to give up faith completely. I wonder if these are some of the symptoms that even though we have started to run a little sort of slower or not at the pace that we should be. I wonder if those symptoms are present in your life here this morning. We'll look at that um, just a little bit more as we go through the passage. But what do we see as we work our way through Hebrews 12? First of all, we see an example to follow, or the example to follow in verse 1 to 3 or thereabouts. And there's two examples that the writer draws his listeners to. The first one is of that cloud or that crowd of witnesses. And of course, the link is to Hebrews 11. It's that list of characters from the Old Testament and how they lived out their faith and how they um, lived that life of obedience. I find this encouraging because we know the full story, not maybe every detail, but we know enough to know that this list of people, that they were human, that they had issues that they had trials, that they had stuff that they dealt with. We know that they didn't always get it right. And yet here they are in this list of people who by faith walked uprightly before God. And so he links this like running the race, our running the race and our need to endure to this cloud of witnesses. And he says, they're there, you're surrounded by them. And even in that isolation of what they were going through, he he reminds them, look, you may be alone, you may be feeling persecution or dealing with persecution, but be aware there is just this cloud, this group of witnesses who have gone on before and they've ran well. And pay attention because if they could run well, you could run well too. Notice also what we're... what we learn from them, let us also, as well as that cloud of witnesses, we are to lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. Not sure if you're familiar with the Amazing Race kind of shows. Um, uh, we've, I haven't watched them all by any means, but watched a few over the years. And so, of course, it's that you know, a game where you're trying to follow clues and drive and find more clues, and eventually you find the finish line and you've got to get there first. And often, when they come close to that finish line, you'll see the teams who have had you know, backpacks of supplies and clothes and, and different stuff like that. They throw off that backpack And then they throw off their coat and they give her. They just run for that finish line. They're throwing off everything that is a hindrance. I don't know if you guys remember this one, but there was one where they threw off a little too much. They threw off the guy coming out of the train, left his bag and left his passport and ended up getting stranded in some country in Europe and out of the game. So don't do that. But um, they, you see that picture of just throwing away the things that hinder. And it's just that concept of be careful, be careful. There's a possibility that stuff in our lives, and I don't just mean physical stuff, but things can hinder us from running well. Things can hinder us from running at the speed that God wants us to run. Now again, this is not about full bore and always out of breath. I'm not saying that God is expecting more and more and more and more. But just that concept, look, just that imagery of the race. You don't run that race with an extra baggage. And so we need to be aware. Is there stuff in our lives? Is there things that we're doing? Is there a mindset that in a sense would be just like that runner who would be carrying extra weight? But we're to, we're to lay aside, we're to put it away. Then also the sin which clings so closely. The sin which clings so closely. Sometimes it's stuff that can slow us down. Sometimes it's sin. 
I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I know for sure I have, where you go through a period where something in your life, you elevate it too high. You give it too much of a high position. It sort of takes the position of a God. You start serving it. And all of a sudden, by doing that, you've sort of moved God down the chain somewhat. It's not maybe sometimes that you've turned your back on him or forsaken him, but it's just that the wrong balance and that sin has crept in or that that issue has crept in and you value it more and it clings so closely. Sometimes when I come home, maybe not so much now that my kids are a bit bigger, it's not quite the same, but maybe maybe even more so when I was coming to the time to leave home, And my kids didn't want me to leave. And so they would just cling, like just cling to your legs. And so you'd be trying to walk or, you know, and they'd be doing the, hey, daddy, you know, and that's, and it's great. Don't get me wrong. I don't mean to complain about it. Um, But it's just that picture of trying to run while something is just opposed to you running. It's holding you back. Um, and so that's a picture of this sin. It's sort of an opposition to what we're trying to do. If we're trying to run well, it's trying to slow us down to a stop. So we need to realize the significance of sin and how it affects our ability to run. That's the first example to follow, that cloud of witnesses. The second one is the Lord Jesus. There in verse 2 and 3. Um, Look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He's our example to follow, but he's also the source of the strength that we need to run well. That's what you see there when it says uh, um, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He's made it possible for our faith, and he will finish our faith. And just that awareness, here's this writer writing to this church that had some significant health issues and saying, hey, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the one who is the founder, the cause of faith, but also the perfecter, the completer of faith. And so we need to keep our eyes on him. Do you see the formula that we see about Jesus' life? The joy that was set before him, so future tense joy, present tense suffering. He endured the cross and despising the shame. I think we need to remember that example. Sometimes it's just possible that we can get tricked in our minds into thinking it should be lots of joy now. And let me tell you, we do. We have a blessed life. But we're not promised no pain. We're not promised no suffering. We're not promised no trials. And so we need to remember just this formula that yes, there is future joy And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He endured this cross and he despised its shame. Think about that, the thing that was shame. He looked down upon it. The thing that should have embarrassed him and did embarrass him in a sense, but he knew that it was part of it. It was just the cup that he had to drink. And so as we think about running well, have we got that same mindset that this here and now might be tough? That this here and now might take us all that we can do to, as it were, put a foot in in front of one another. And maybe there might be days where we might even just shuffle along, but yet we run that race. We're still got our eyes in Jesus and we're walking well because of that joy that is before us, that eternal hope. The other thing you see about the Lord Jesus there is in verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. So evaluate just what Christ endured. And you see that such hostility, both the quantity and in a sense the quality. It was the worst hostility. We've got to keep our eyes. We've got to evaluate the suffering and the shame that he went through. Think about that last week he was here on earth. Think about the the weightiness of the garden of Gethsemane. Think about the the pain of even his own disciples who didn't understand what was going on there and fell asleep. Think of the trials. Those mock trials were really they were they were fake. They were they were not following the rules that they should have followed. Think of those witnesses that disagreed. Think again of just even that beating and that mocking. Think again of what it must have been like for him to walk through those city streets holding that part of the cross and being so physically weak and in such pain and agony and then people shouting and screaming all kinds of abuse at him. Think of the hostility of the cross. 
The reality that there, not only was he being mocked and scorned by men, but that he would take on just the wrath of God. But we can even go before that. Think of John 1. Remember what it's, how it describes him? He came to his own, and his own received him not. Now, did he know it was going to happen this way? I believe he did. But remember, he was fully human. Remember what it was like to live out his life and to do these miracles and to speak these words and to bear this witness that he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah, and to be rejected by his people so that he would say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you were not willing. The hostility that he had to deal with, such hostility, or even in Isaiah, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. As we think about running well, we need to consider him who endured from sinners such, such hostility against himself. Why? So that you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. I wonder this morning, I wonder if that's how you feel, if you can identify with that sort of description, weary and faint-hearted. Can I encourage you just to spend some time today or this week just considering him Look into the Lord Jesus and what he has done for us. So that's the example um, to follow. Then we see the energy required in verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. It's really that parallel of the Lord Jesus and how he obeyed. He was obedient, I believe it says Philippians put it, even unto death. Death on a cross. And it's just highlighting just even the, the length and the, the breadth of obedience that Christ offered. And so it's, again, it's that same parallel that we are to, to be obedient to the point of shedding blood, to the point of where it costs us everything. You see, even Jesus alluded to this. He said, look, if you're going to come after me, you've got to deny yourself and take up his cross and follow me. And that taking up his cross and following me was just that same kind of, of imagery. It's going to be obedience unto death. Obedience unto death. Follow his example. Follow him. And he goes on to say, whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So what energy is required to endure? It's just this kind of energy. It's going to cost us everything. It's going to cost us everything. That determination to resist until the point of shedding blood. Look a little bit about the difference though between verse 3 and verse 4. There's a subtle difference. Do you see there in the first line of verse 3? Consider him, so that's Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility. And then verse 4, in your struggle against what the next word could have been, sinners. But it's not, it's the word sin. And I think the significance of the difference is, is that reality that Christ was sinless. He didn't have to battle through a sinful nature. He didn't have to battle with ongoing sin in his life. And yet here, in how it's worded, it just highlights the reality of one of the things that will stop us from enduring. is just even sin within. Yes, we have to endure against opposition from the outside, and we will face that and discouragement and those kind of things. But also recognizing that there's that death to self, that awareness of our own sinful nature that can sometimes be the reason why we do not endure. You have the same kind of imagery in Colossians. We're told there to put to death, therefore. He's writing to Christians. And he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then he lists a bunch of sins. So here, the writer of the Colossians, same thing he said to Christians, hey, be aware, there's a battle that you have to fight. Or in Galatians, same thing, or, well, same kind of thing, but I say, walk by the Spirit. And so if you obey the Spirit, or if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify or feed the desires of the flesh. 
And so there's just that difference between sinners and sin that I think is just a good reminder that even in our struggle against sin, we need to be so aware of just our own sinful heart. We need to be aware of our weaknesses and just our tendencies to give in to sin in certain areas. I was saying in the first service, that's, that can be really hard. Man, it's sometimes so easy. I'm aware of, remember that, that passage where it says, you know, you, you talk about the speck in somebody else's life or in somebody else's eye, but you're not aware of like the log in your own. And I can so identify with that. I can so identify with just that blindness in my own life to the presence of sin or to the tendencies to sin. I was at a, a conference a number of years ago and the guy was preaching, it wasn't this passage, but it was a similar kind of passage. And so he'd give us homework. And his homework was, he said, you know, he, well, let me fill in a little bit more of the context. He was talking along these same kind of lines of just as a pastor, as a church leader, um, just the... How the presence of sin, or how if we don't fight sin in our lives, it's going to cripple our ministries, it's going to cripple our integrity, it's going to cripple our walk with God. And so then he said, I've got some homework for you to do. I want you to go home, and he said, you know, take your wife out, buy a nice meal, and when you've got her attention, you say, are you aware of just sin patterns in my life that I seem to be unaware of? And I thought, oh, that's really hard. I didn't actually do it. And I've only ever mentioned this on the Sunday that my wife's not here. Um, So you read into that what you want. Um, He then took it further and said, and you pastors that have church secretaries or administrators, ask, ask them, is is there any, you know, is there any times when you just see these constant sinful habits that just keep coming up that I don't seem aware of. And he, he, he went on just to explain, who's going to call the pastor out on their sin? And yet you've got to ask people, you've got to have people in their life who are going to call you out. Now, I don't know what to do with that exactly. Truthfully, I'm not sure what that's meant to look like. But here, I love the illustration that he gave. It was one of their family traditions that when their kids were off school, they would take them to whatever city they lived in. There was, I guess, a, a business area, a fairly big city, and up, up scale, kind of up uh, market clients would come to this diner, and so he would bring his kids, and they did waffles or pancakes or something at this diner. He said one time they were in as a family, and there was this guy, they watched him come in, dressed in a designer suit, you know, the little uh, briefcase thing under his arm, and he opens it, and there he's getting out his, his iPad or whatever and he's going through his stuff for the day and getting himself mentally prepared for that day. And there he is, you know, just dressed immaculately. Just designer suit, not a hair out of place, expensive shoes, all polished. And as this guy's eating his breakfast, he's eating the bagel, and as he takes that bite, well, he squishes out a big chunk of cream cheese and it lands right down the middle of his tie. And he's oblivious. He has no clue. And so now this guy that's given the illustration says, I have this choice. I can tell this is a proud man who takes his appearance very well. It looks like he's going to about to go into a meeting and he's getting ready for a day. Do I tell him, hey, you got cream cheese on your tie? He didn't. <laughs> I don't know if the guy went on and went to that meeting. But it's just that awareness. I, I, it was a real helpful illustration just in recognizing that, that we need that accountability. We need those who will just say, hey, look, brother, I love you. But I can't help but wonder if that behavior, if that action, if it isn't like a little bit of cream cheese on your tie, if it isn't just like a little, the awareness of sin. I, as I say, I'm not sure exactly how far you to go with that. It could become fairly destructive, I'm aware of that. But just that reality in which if we're thinking, if we want to run well, if we want to run with endurance, if we're challenged to resist sin to the point of shedding blood, then it tells us that we need to have a, a real serious attitude to sin. And we see that even in Christ's teaching where he would say, look, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Oh, I hope you're not and sort of playing around with it this morning. Now, just to make sure you know, that's hyperbole, just talking about the seriousness of sin. But it affects our relationship with God. So, let's wrap that point up. The energy required. Now, let's finish with this last one. The relationship to remember. It's verse 5 to 11. And you see him just on, uh, sort of unfolding just the richness of why do we face discipline 
So you can sort of picture it. They're, they were running well. They're not running well. They're growing weary. He challenges them. Look, you haven't resisted sin to the point of shedding your blood. And then he starts to explain the purpose of discipline. How was God at work in their life? What was he doing? And often I find that in my own life again. Just that whenever I'm in a bit of a tailspin, whenever I haven't got my game face on, when I'm not walking with the Lord, when I'm, when I'm not uh, just loving him as I ought to, then often you can kind of start to misread what's going on in terms of his relationship with you. And so you can see he challenges him. It's from the Proverbs there in verse 5. He says, look, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. It would seem that the response was, oh, God's disciplining us? Ah, no big deal. Um, he said, whoa, 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 don't regard it lightly. Um, nor be weary when reproved him. Oh, here goes God again, reproving me seemed to be the response. And then he brings out, rather than chiding him and just leaving it that, he highlights why it's so important. Because he talks about the relationship. Look, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. I'll be honest, it's not my first response, but it should be in a sense that whenever we face that discipline, we're just reminded again of the preciousness that God would bestow his love on you and me and God would call us sons or children of God. And it's just that reminder that he takes that relationship seriously. And that as our heavenly father, as he bestows his love on us, he bestows his love on us in discipline, as well as bestowing favor and these other things upon us as well. And so he reminds them that, look, yes, discipline is tough. But it's that assurance that God is at work and in that relationship with you. And so be encouraged. And again, maybe that's what we need to be reminded of this morning. Maybe you're in tough Maybe you're just dealing with some kind of discipline and your response to that. And maybe you feel you're in that bit of a tailspin, just not sure which way's up. And just to be reminded, look, yes, it's not nice or easy when God disciplines us, but it's out of that relationship that he has with us. And it's also a purpose to it. You see that there in verse 9, or is it 10? Um, yeah, 10 it is. Um, where he's doing that contrast between earthly fathers and how they discipline us for a short time, but God is altogether wiser in how he disciplines us. But the purpose of it is that we may share his holiness, that we may become more like him. I think the problem is sometimes God can see more potential in us than we see in ourselves, and God thinks highly, more highly of us than we think of ourselves. I think sometimes we just think we could never amount to much. And yet God says, no, by my grace, I save you and you're going to run well. You're going to run well and you're going to become more like me. You're going to become more holy. But it's not always easy because it involves that process of discipline. So what do we do? How do we respond? Just as we finish up here, I have four things um, just that I want to finish with just real quick as we wrap it up. What do we do if we find ourselves, you just say, yeah, I get it. I'm not running like I should. How do I get back to running well? I think you see it there in verse uh, 12, kind of through to 17. Um, there's more than what I'm going to say. But first one, lift your drooping knees, or sorry, your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. So you can just picture that person who is, you know, the head's down. They're not walking well. And I think what he's saying to them is, in light of what God has done for you, in light of the relationship, in light of the fact that you can run a race and run it well, don't be discouraged. Put your hope again in God. And maybe that's your response this morning, or needs to be your response. We just need to just spend some time meditating on the promises of God, and to be strengthened in that. Maybe it's the next thing there. You're to make straight paths for your feet, verse 13, so that what is lame may not be, be out of joint, but rather be healed. And so it's this picture of like walking in straight paths. And it's that concept of sin being twisted paths, God's ways being straight paths. But it, instead of saying God makes a straight path for us, it's highlighting us and what we have to do and make straight paths for your feet. Make good decisions. Maybe it's just a, a, a mental decision you need to make. I know something is wrong. I know I've been indulging in it. I know I've been pursuing certain things. And you need to back off from that and just pursue God's ways. Now, you know and I both know it's easy to say that from this platform. Oh, that act and of, of repentance, that act of honoring God, that act of letting go of something, you know it can be really hard. 
But yet that's, again, a response if we're not enduring like we ought to. Lift your drooping hands. Make straight paths. Strive for peace. Verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone. Sometimes that's what happens when, when we find ourselves not enduring. It's just easy to be out of sync with everybody. Either one, we're just so self-conscious of how we're not running and we just, oh, we just, it gets in our head and we're not sure how to respond. Or even sometimes it's bitterness where we just respond poorly to people round about us. But we need to strive for peace with everyone. That is hard to do. That is really hard to do, but it needs to be a primary goal in the life of a church. Just striving for peace with everybody. And think of that word strive. Like it's, like, it's almost like fighting, which is the irony of it. You're, you're fighting for peace with everyone, holding on for peace with everyone. Again, maybe that's what your response needs to be this morning. And then the last one there, obtain uh, the grace of God. Verse uh, 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. It's only by God's grace and by his strength that we will run this race well. It's only in him. It's only by what he's done for us. It's only by resting in his finished work that we will be able to grow in him. And so we need to obtain that grace. The beauty of this morning is that we get to respond to this kind of a passage with communion. That invitation to come and to have fellowship with God. God wants to have fellowship with his people. And so there's that amazing invitation. And maybe in this process of coming and having fellowship with him, it's where we need to do business with him or just need to just say, hey God, would you just lead me in these areas? Would you show me if there's stuff that's stopping me from running well? And so I encourage you to do that even as we transition just now to this time of communion. I'm going to pray and then the the team will come up and we'll um, serve communion. Let's pray. Lord, we are just amazed, amazed, oh God, just at the depth of suffering of the Lord Jesus. From when we consider his example and just even those two words, such hostility from sinners. I guess that's four words, but Lord, you, you know. And Lord, I, I just pray, oh God, that you would shape our hearts. Shape our hearts to, to be aware of who you are. Shape our hearts to be aware of just the toughness of running well. And yet fix our eyes on that goal that is set before us. Lord, even as Emmanuel Baptist, Lord, help us to run well as a group. Lord, just for those who may be discouraged this morning, Lord, I want to pray that you would give them that strength as it were to put one foot in front of the other. Lord, maybe, Lord, for some who are just aware that it's sin in their own lives that is the reason they don't run well. Lord, I want to pray that you would help us to be serious in our response to these things. Lord, just to make straight paths for our feet. And Lord, again, we just pray for your grace. Your grace to walk well. Your grace to walk worthy. Lord, just aware that in all things, Lord, you have bestowed your favor upon us. You have bestowed such rich blessings upon us. Or we think of 1 John where it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called sons or children of God and such we are. It's certain. And we're thankful, Lord, that that means that you will discipline us. But it's not to break us and to crush us. But, Lord, to make us into the treasure and into the people that you want us and you've created us to be. Lord, just thank you for that assurance. Remind us of that this week, we pray. And, Lord, we ask these things in your precious name. Amen.